this morning we declare that the king is coming oh yes hallelujah let every heart be fixed upon king jesus let every tribe and tongue prepare the way let every heart be filled with expectation why because the king is coming the king is coming open the doors up. yes come let the light in people get ready people get ready this morning ready to worship we came him. to worship him open the doors up oh yes come let the light in people get ready people get ready we bow
It's a narrow road that leads to life, but I want to be on it. It's a narrow road, and the mercy is wide, but you're good on your promise. If you knew me then, 
you'd believe me now you turned my whole life upside down took the old and he made he made it new that's what the mercy of God can do now I'm alive to tell the story how I'm overcome his goodness and mercy the power of his blood I'm so glad that my freedom wasn't based on what I've done. It's goodness and mercy, power of His blood, power of His blood. Oh. thought I deserved to be six feet beneath the earth for all the things I've done the things I've said the choices made that I regret I would still be lost but for the mercy of God, now I'm alive. I'm alive to tell the story. To tell the story.
the mercy, by the mercy of God. Oh, thank you for the mercy. Mm, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood. You know it. What can make me whole again? And we say it again. What can wash away my sin? What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Now I'm alive to tell the story How I've overcome His goodness and mercy The power of the blood I'm so glad that my freedom Wasn't based on what I've done His goodness and mercy Say it with us the power of the blood. If this is your first time at Bonita Valley, we invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy the service. If you want some info on BVCC, simply complete our online connect card. Here's how it works. Scan the QR code you'll find in the seat pocket in front of you with the camera on your smartphone. Open the link that will take you to Connect Card. You'll find a number of connecting options, including first-time guests, prayer requests, I want some info on a Bonita Valley ministry. Check the appropriate connection box you're after. Push Submit, and we'll get back to you ASAP. If you're a first-time guest today, please stop by Guest Central at the end of the service and pick up a special gift bag we have just for you. We'd like to take a few moments to tell you about some things coming up for you and your family at Bonita Valley. Attention all middle and high school students. Did you know that we have two opportunities every week to stay connected at BVCC Youth? Every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. in the Life Center Gym, there's food, fun, games, and an engaging message. On Sundays, our youth classes are available for both the 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. services in the Fireside Room. It's a great opportunity to spend some time connecting in small groups with other students just like you. If you are looking for a safe place where you can connect with other students and experience God in a real way, Benita Valley Youth is for you. We can't wait to see you there. If you're a fully devoted follower of Jesus, you have a ministry and a mission. Our ministry is how we serve other believers inside the church. Our mission is how we serve the world outside the church. Come discover the mission God has for you in the next 401 base class, My Mission in the World. Pastor Jeff will be teaching the 401 seminar on Sunday, May 5th from 5 to 7.30 p.m. in the Family Center. A casual meal and childcare will be provided. Sign up online at bonitavalley.com slash base class. This Wednesday evening, special guest Pastor Bernard Kirabira from the nation of Uganda joins us for a powerful night of ministry at 7 p.m. in the Worship Center. We believe God has entrusted us to be managers of our time, talent, and treasures. We believe He wants us to use temporary resources to make a real and eternal difference in our world. 
And that's what giving at BVCC is all about. When we give to God, we see lives change and transform, both others and ours. There are three ways to give at BVCC. Online at bonitavalley.com slash giving, by texting Bonita Valley to 833-303-9325, or by mailing your offering to BVCC 4744 Bonita Road, Bonita, California, 91902. During our Sunday services, we offer a professionally staffed nursery that will lovingly care for your little one up to two years of age. We also offer an outdoor patio area and a family room with TV monitors for parents who choose to keep children under four years of age with them. Pastor Davida and her team lead incredibly fun ministries for preschool and elementary age children in the Life Center gym. Bonita Valley Youth also hosts classes at 9 and 11 a.m. for students in middle and high school in the Fireside Room. During today's service, you can take notes, sign up for events, and even give using your smartphone. Simply use the Follow the Service QR code located in the seat pocket in front of you. Thanks for spending part of your weekend with us. This weekend, I want to start a brand new series with you, and I want to begin this one a little differently. I want to begin by telling you who this series is for, okay? Uh, this series, first of all, it is for the young and the older. <laughs> I didn't say old, because our spirit doesn't age. We don't feel older. We just kind of look older. Uh, but it's for, it's for students. It's for seniors. It's for in-betweeners. Uh, this, this series is for you no matter what age or stage or life you're in. That's who this series is for. This series is for anyone who feels like your life or your faith life has stalled or it's stuck. If you feel like your life or your faith life is just stuck in a monotonous rut, don't raise your hand, but it happens. The series is for those of you who might be facing overwhelming obstacles, maybe giant-sized enemies, and they come in all kinds of shapes and forms, physical, emotional, financial, relationship, spiritual, but there's just, some, there's just some walls in your way. There's some big problems in your way. There's some enemies in your way. If you haven't had one of those, hang in there. You will. Enemies that, that intimidate us and enemies that make our life just that much more challenging. That's who the series is for. The series is for anyone who's ever made a bad decision. Anyone who's ever made a wrong choice that cost you and it cost others. Anyone who's ever made a bad, costly choice and wondered, can I ever recover from this? If you've ever wondered, can I ever dream again and ever experience a dream again after what I've done and what's happened to me, this series is for you. This series is for anyone who wants to step into your God-promised future and you have one. Some of you may not know that, but in Jeremiah, God says, I know the plans I have for you, plans to give you a hope and a future. I haven't come to hurt you, to harm you. To w I have come to give you a hope, and I have come to give you a future. That is God's promise. There's not a person God has made that he has not made a promised future for. That includes you and me. That's who this series is for. Now, I don't know if this series is for you, but I know it's for me. Because almost everything I just named to you, I've had and experienced and, and I am experiencing in my life. I've never met anyone who doesn't need to step in to the promised future God has for them. And that's what this series is all about. I met someone just this week. I was, I was out and I was at a business and a friend of mine and, and, and one of his children, adult children, was there. And says, I hear you're a pastor. And so that either they want to talk to you or they want to confess to you or they don't want to talk to you. That's kind of how... That works when they find out you're a pastor. Well, we talked for a few moments about church, and we well, used to go to church, and we go to church now, and kind of bad experiences they, they had had. And I just, well, you know, you, you got to give it another shot. Because it, it may not be now what you experienced then. Because how many know you've never met anyone who doesn't have a God-promised future 
But a lot of people we know are missing it and missing out on it. And where we're going in this series for the next, the next few weeks, and, and I've titled it, as you can see, it, it's behind me, I've titled it Stepping Into Your God-Promised Future because this series is really a how-to series for experiencing the promised future God has for you. And we're going to study the Old Testament. We're going to look, it's based on the Old Testament book of Joshua. And we're like, hold on a second. What does an old book have to tell me about my life today? Just show up and you'll find out. Because Paul says what happened to them in the Old Testament is examples for us. It's models for us of what to do, what not to do. It was, it was written, what happened to them is a story teaching us about how you and I can experience God's biggest and best in our life. In fact, all the time, when Jesus quoted scripture, he was quoting the Old Testament. There's so much of the old that teaches us how to be new and how to experience the new God has for us. And so for the next several weeks, we're going to be focusing on a book that was literally written about how a generation was to enter in and engage and experience and enjoy the future God had planned and promised them. And what they did, we need to do to experience God's promised future for us. I want to give you what, what the theme verse for this entire series is. It's found in Joshua chapter 1 and verse 3. And here's what God says. I promise you what I promised Moses. Wherever you set what foot, wherever you step, you will be on land I have given you. That's where the title, stepping into. See, God's already given it to us. That's not the question. Will we step into it's the question. God has a promised future for us. The question is, will you step into it? Will you and I experience it? And the stepping into God's promised future wasn't only for Moses and Joshua and the Israelites. Because it's so easy, well, that was what God said to them. No, it's what God says to us. And I'll show you from God's word. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 1, verse 20. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are what? Yes, in Christ. Now, some of your translations say amen. That means yes. When you say amen, you're saying yes, I agree with that. I affirm that. And the Apostle Paul says, no matter how many promises God made, I mean, know that every promise God made is made in Christ, through Christ. It wasn't just made to them, it's made for us. Let me put it like this. God's word is so full. We talked about it on Easter, how many promises God has made, over 7,000 in the Bible. And how Peter says that it's through God's promises. They're the tickets God gives us into his plans and purposes for our life. Let me tell you something about God. God has a yes in his heart for you. He does. Will you forgive me? Yes. Will you help me? Yes. Will you guide me? Yes. Will you bless me? Yes. God has a yes in his heart for you. He does. Every promise of God is yes. Now, come on, how many of you have people like there are, how many of you have met no people? I don't mean they know it all. I mean, everything's a no. No, no, God has a, but, but stay with me. Because stepping into God's promises is our yes to God. See, God's promises are yes to us. When we step into them, we're saying yes to the promises and yes to God. And that's something we have to learn. And that's what this series is really all about. And that's why it's a series I need, I believe we all need to experience God's biggest and best. And so in this opening message, just kind of getting us started, from the first chapter of Joshua, he starts off by saying, step into, step into the promise. We're going to talk about three just foundational stepping lessons. Get these three lessons and they'll carry you throughout your entire life. They'll carry us throughout the entire book of Joshua. So here, they're in your notes on, if you want to open your phones, online. Here's the first one. To experience our God-promised future, never stop Stepping out. Never stop stepping out. Now, let me explain. Israel's miraculous crossing of the Red Sea was a stepping out of Egypt, out of slavery, out of bondage, out of 400 years. It was a stepping out, stepping away from where they had been. And stepping out always involves that. It always involves an exit step. 
from an enslaved life, an old life, and it's a vital step. How many, most of you know the phrase, out with the old, in with the... How many have no room for new because you're still stuck with so much old? Okay? That's why we have garage sales. Garage sales just, it cracks me up. Hey, I want to swap junk with you. So anyway, so just, it's out with junk to make more room for more junk. Out with the old, in with the new. But, but there's got to be an exit, a leaving, a, a, a getting rid of, and that's exit step. That's step number one. Crossing the Jordan River, which is really what the book of Joshua tells us all about, was step two. It was an entering step. It's not enough to get out, you got to get in. To get out, you have to take a step. To get in, you have to take a step. And here's what, where an entire generation of Israelites messed up. They got out, but they never got in. They took step one, but they didn't keep stepping. They didn't take step two. They got out of where they needed to leave, but they never got into where God was calling them to be. Mm. And that place in between was called the wilderness. Now, I have been in Africa several times, and there's a few countries, and they actually have a name for it. They sometimes call it borderland. And between one country and the next country, there's a piece of property. It's usually not very large. It can only be sometimes a few hundred yards. But nobody owns it because of the conflict between the countries. No one owns it. There's no police. There's no, there's no fire department. It's just like if you're in there, it's like no man's land. It's borderland. You're not there and you're not there. You're in between. And that's where a generation of Israelites died in between. Let me tell you something about in between. You'll die in between being out of but not being into and that's where so many people find themselves feeling stalled and stuck and joyless and frustrated. In fact, here, here's how one writer puts it. In Egypt, the Israelites were enslaved to Pharaoh. In the wilderness, they were free from Pharaoh, but enslaved to fear. Because they refused to step into the promised land, they languished in the desert. Only those who step into Canaan discover a place of victory. Stepping out is vital. Listen, Egypt for you and me represents our BC life. What is BC before Christ? Before Jesus came, before Jesus died, before Jesus did for us what he did for us. What, before Jesus paid for our old hurts, habits, hang ups, sins on the cross, I mean, no, Jesus liberated us from Egypt. We talked about that on Easter. When he died on the cross and said, it is finished, he paid our bill to get us out, to set us free. Paul says he defeated sin, death, and the grave. He did everything to give you and me an amazing life. That's, that's Egypt is getting out. Jesus is not only our way out, he's our way, he's the way. And the Bible says this about what he has for us. Second, Chron Second Corinthians 5, verse 17, Paul writes, when someone becomes a Christian, they become a what? New person. The old life is what? Gone. That's the step out. A new life has what? It's begun. It's not complete. It's begun. We start. We never stop stepping. Listen carefully. Never stop stepping out and stepping in to the more God has for every area of your life. If I can give you a very simple yet vital challenge, don't settle. Don't settle. Don't stop in any area of your life because there's more. Paul writes, Ephesians 3 verse 20, Now glory be to God who by his mighty power at work within us is able to do, say it, far, oh, yes, it one more time, far, far more than we would ever dare to ask or even dream of. So let me just tell you again, I don't know where you are. I don't know what's happening in your life. I don't know whether you're struggling or whether you're doing well. I can just tell you this, there's more. That whatever's happening in your life, there's more. You're not finished yet. But some of us just get stuck in that borderland. We get stuck because we stop stepping. Now, if I, let me kind of help you with this. Historians tell us, that on either side of the port of Spain, there were two large columns, two large pillars. They had Latin words inscribed on them, ni plus ultra. 
Ne plus ultra, translation, no more beyond. When you got to the western side of Spain, you got to the ocean, they're saying, you've arrived. There's no more beyond this. This is it. This is the end. This is the best. You've arrived. No more beyond here. This is it. But Christopher Columbus, and remember him, didn't believe or buy that. He wouldn't stop stepping out, well, actually sailing out. He believed this can't be it. There's got to be something on the other side of that water. There's got to be something more than this. This is not, there's got to be more beyond this. And, and so you, you, some of you know, you know, he raised the funds, he had to get all kinds of fun and money, and he took off in his ships and discovered the new worlds. Well, they were, it already been discovered, but they were new to him. Then he came back and told the king of Spain and brought all these things back with him. Very tight story of the history. And when he came back and new worlds were discovered, the king of Spain changed. The motto was, was knee plus ultra, no more beyond. And the king said, take the knee off. Took it off their coins, took it off the signs. So now their new motto was, no, was not no more beyond, it was more beyond. That became the motto. I mean, that ought to be your motto. That no matter where I am, there's more beyond. That God is not finished with me. He's not finished with any area of my life. There's more beyond where I am right now. I believe that's what God was telling Joshua, a generation of Israelites, you and me. First three verses, Joshua 1, go like this. And after the death of Moses, that's how the book starts. The Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant. He said, Moses, my servant, is dead. Therefore... The time has come for you to lead these people, the Israelites, across the Jordan River into the land I am giving them. I promise you, don't miss how many times he says promise, I promise you what I promised Moses. Wherever you set foot, you will be on land I have given you. Now you say, what kind of book does it kind of start? Here's how the book starts out. Moses died, but God's promises never do. Moses died, but that wasn't the end of God's plans or promises. They were to honor Moses because Moses was honorable. He had done so much for the nation. But, but God wanted the Israelites and you and me to appreciate the past, people in our life, people in our past, learn from those people in our past, learn from our past, but don't live there. You will constantly find God saying something like this, like he says in Isaiah, behold, I am do something new. Today, I do a new thing. It springs up, do you not perceive? Here's what God is saying to you and me. You want a God word for today? Here's the word. Next is now. Mm. Three of you got that. I don't know where you are in whatever area of life you're in, but next is now. There's a next now for us, and that was the challenge. Thank God for the past. Learn from it, but don't live in it. Because you'll never experience the next that's now if you get stuck in yesterday. So the first challenge was, I want, he said, get them going. Take the next step. Step into the promise and don't stop stepping. Here's the second. To experience our God-promised future, never stop stepping up. That's a second challenge that God gave to Joshua and the Israelites and he's giving us. Stepping up is about engaging and participating, not just being a spectator. Now see, it's, I, I know in this kind of setting it's so easy, it's like, like we're spectators. You are not spectators of God's promises. You are a participator if you're gonna experience it. Okay? We're not spectators when it comes to God's plans and purposes. God challenges Joshua. He challenges the Israelites. He challenges us. And you'll find the same challenge throughout his word. I'll get to you quickly from Peter, the Apostle Peter. 2 Peter 1, verse 3, Peter writes, By his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. Don't miss that. Everything you need, God has given you. We have received all this by coming to know him, the one who called us to himself, verse 5. In view of all this, all what? That God's given us everything. Make every, what? Effort to respond to God's promises. All right, time I have for money. 
God has given us everything we need, so make every effort. Well, hold, hold, hold it. If he's given me everything I need, why do I need to make an effort? Is it, is it God gave me everything I need or I need to make an effort? And the answer is yes. Listen. Having everything we need is not the same thing as making all of it we can. Having everything you need is not the same thing as making all of it you can. When I was a, when I was a student, uh, like senior in high school, I went my first year of college, I'd, I'd do summer jobs. I got hired by a, a man in my home church because you always need connections. So there's a guy in my home church, he was the, the, unc- he was the uncle of my best friend. He actually hired both of us because I was his friend. It's connections. Now, my friend actually could do things. I didn't do much, but, but I got hired along with my friend. And, and the, the, the man had a, a business of building prefab houses. You're like, what is that? Well, the entire house basically came on a truck. It was like a Lego house, sort of. Uh, trucks would come in. It was trucks that had the studs, they had the drywall, they had the plumbing, they had the wiring. They literally, the entire house was, was prefab, it was pre Most of it was pre-cut, already designed. You just kind of had to put it together. And so these trucks would roll in, they would roll in, they would roll in, and they 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 would take the stuff off. One of my jobs was helping unload it and stack it and guard it. You had every, when, when the trucks finished, everything for a house was sitting right there on that lot. You had everything you needed for a house. Except somebody had to put it together. Except for the effort. The effort to do something with what you have. How many know that you have been blessed by God with so many gifts you can't imagine? The question is not do you have giftings. The question is, are you making every effort with your giftings? That's why Paul says work hard. That's why Paul says discover it. And he says do it and work on it and develop it. Why? Because you you have everything you need for the amazing future and plans God has for you. But the effort... The effort is our part of the equation. It's not all God or all us. It's all God and all us. It's both. And God challenges Joshua, and he challenges the Israelites, and he challenges us. He said, get them up, get them moving, get them going, cross. It's time to get going to a land I have given you. You're not fighting for victory. You're fighting from it. It's already yours. But how do I experience it? By making every effort. You'll find that little phrase again and again and again in the New Testament. Make every effort, make every effort, make every effort. And God gives them specifics, okay? Because nothing's dynamic until it's specific. So there's many challenges in God's word about what we're to do. But God gives two special ones here. And they're really the keys for going and getting going. And, and, And I'll put them in your notes. Here's the first one. God challenges us to participate by studying his word. Let me show you again, Joshua 1 verse 8, and and God says to Joshua, study this book of what? It's an instructions book. When? Continually. Never stop stepping out, never stop studying, meditate on it day and night. You're like, what does meditation mean? First of all, how many of you go like, first of all, I can't sit cross-legged, I can't do that. It's not, it's not, hmm, no, what? Let me give you a, kind of a working definition. A meditation is, is, is simply worrying in a good way. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever taken a class on worrying or how many of you just natural. What is, what is worrying? Worrying is fixating on a problem or an issue or a fear. When you worry, you just don't stop thinking about it. I can't sleep because I'm thinking about it. I can't, can't eat because I'm thinking about it. I can't stop eating because I'm thinking about it. Because it's just, it just never, it never leaves your mind. That's worry, right? And worry will choke you and strangle you. Meditation is worrying positively. It is so filling your heart and mind with Christ that you just, you keep thinking about it. The principles, the practices, the words. But the Bible says, let God's words dwell in you richly. I mean, live in you. Studying, what does studying mean? It doesn't just mean, and I, I don't, uh, hopefully you try to read through scripture and, 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 and you read through it a year. How many of you have ever tried one of those Bible programs and then you're like two weeks in and you're already five books behind? 
Studying is not how much of God's word can I read, how much of God's word can I get into, but how much of God's word can get into me. How much of God's word gets into me? I was sharing with you a few weeks back that, that like, I'll, I'll read, and I read a variety of translations, but I, one, of the, I, one of the ones I read a lot for just my devotional part is the Message Bible. It's just incredibly contemporary and fresh and speaks to me. I underline it. I mark it. My, 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 the Message Bible for me, the cover's fallen off. I've taped it on. It, 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 it looks like a mess. You go, buy another one. No, because I've marked it up so much. I have smiley faces, I have arrows. I mean, I mean, it's an instruction book, and I use it. And so, so, and in fact, it reminds me years ago, it's a super old quote, I think it was Spurgeon. I don't know, it was one of the old guys, great guys, who said, a person whose Bible is falling apart usually isn't. <laughs> All right, think about that one. The person whose Bible, because they read it and they study it, when you're reading and study, I'm not reading for speed. I'm reading for growth. And so I'll stop. I'm like, what does that mean? And I'll look it up and I'll ask questions. And I do. If you saw my Bible, I have question marks. I have smiley faces. I have arrows. Like, I'm a visual learner. Everything I do is all marked up. That's why, like, when I'm dead, my books won't be worth anything because they're so messed up. Because they're tools. They're learning tools for me. And so my challenge to you is, again, and, and I thank God for all the teaching opportunities that we offer at Bonita Valley. And I, I love just watching. I love, I sneak in, I watch the women's study. I watch the men's study. I watch, we just finished with our, our, our Financial Peace University. And, and what, the stats on what they did in there, the people that got out of that debt they were in, it's just, it's an amazing, we'll tell you more about that later. But they were studying principles and practices, most from God's word about our finances, I love watching people learn, just watching them and watching them study. So my challenge to you is, and, and I know I don't need to ask you, there's not a person in this room that you eat once a week. So don't let just what happens on a Sunday be all you, all you eat of God's word. So he challenged them to study God's word. He challenged them to study this book. All the kings, when they were anointed king, they were to read through God's word again and again and again and again and again because it's filled with the principles and promises and practices that you and I need to experience life. It's what Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. All scripture is inspired. It means breathed out by God. Useful to teach us what is true. To make us realize what is wrong. It corrects us when we're wrong and teaches us what to do right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Now, this is a whole series in itself, and I won't, I won't break into one in the middle of one. But God's Word teaches us what's right, what's wrong, how to get right, how to stay away from wrong. It teaches us, it, it instructs us, but it doesn't instruct us just so that we can have full heads. It equips us so we can know. That doesn't know what it says. It equips us so we can what? Do. That's the second challenge. Not only study it, here's the second challenge God gave. God challenges us to do his words. Not just to hear them, to do them. Joshua 1 verse 8. Be careful to do everything written in it. You got to know it, but knowing it's not enough. Matthew 7 24, Jesus says. Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice it's like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Now, again, I, I, I just can't stop constantly, but first of all, I'm going to know hearing is hard work. And that's about just, just listening. Most of us were born with the ability to, to, to hear things. But to really hear, to really listen is, re, is real work. And most people don't listen very well. So to hear, hear my words. But don't stop with hearing. He challenges us to put them into practice and says the person who practices them is like a wise person who builds their house on a rock, on a foundation. Now, hearing and studying is how we download God's mind and heart. But the download isn't complete until we do what we downloaded. There's a lot of people who know a lot of stuff, but they don't do it. 
Biblically speaking, if you don't do it, you don't know it. Because knowing is not intellectual, knowing is application. Knowing is doing what I understand. That's why Jesus says in John 13, verse 17, now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you, what? You're not blessed by knowing it, you're blessed by doing what you know. Doing is our part of releasing and realizing God's blessing and best in every area of our life. One of the biggest challenges in my life, and it's not that I have learned it all or know it all by a long shot, but my challenge is not just knowing more, it's doing more of what I know. It's doing what I know. How much of what you know are you doing? How much of what you know are you putting into practice? How much of you, what you know are you, are you downloading by doing in your life? And so he, Moses was told, hear it, do it. Joshua, hear it, do it. That's God's challenge to us to participate in what he promises, participate in his promises by doing. And here's the third. Never stop stepping out, never stop stepping up. And here's the third. To experience our God-promised future, never stop stepping with. Stepping with. We must step out on our own, but we never step into God's promises on our own. We step into God's promised future with him. That was a continued, repeated phrase that God gave to Moses. He gets throughout his word. In fact, let me show you Joshua 5, 1 verse 5. God says, no one will be able to stand against you as long as you live, for I will be, what? With you. I was with Moses. I will not fail you. I will not abandon you. He repeats it. Joshua 1 verse 9. I mean, no, God says things more than once. He repeats it. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is what? With you. Wherever you were go. Do you know the most repeated promise in the Bible is I will be with you? Because if he's not with us, we're in trouble. I love when God was working through Moses and he's leading the children of Israel and they, they were a pain. And Moses was like, God, why'd you ask me to do this? Like, this is just like impossible. And, and, and even God got ticked off and said, okay, listen, I'll just destroy them and give you a whole new crew. And, and Moses, no, 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 no. I'll, I'll take these. And then God says, okay, you just go ahead and I'm going to stay here. I'll send an angel because if I go with you, I might destroy you guys because this is just. And then Moses says, God, if you don't go with us, don't send me. If I don't have your presence, I don't want to. I don't, I just, I don't want just your promises and I don't even want your, I, your angels are great. I want you. How many of you can say, God, I, I, I want to step, but I want to step with you. And if you're not with me, I don't want to go. It's the challenge of being with him. It's the promise that God is with us. It was Jesus' last promise after he rose from the dead and before he ascends into heaven. Matthew 28, verse 19. Therefore, go. The word means keep on going. Step out. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to what? To obey, to do all the commands I have given you. It's not enough to know them, do them, and be sure of this. Last thing he says, I am with you, what? Always, even to the end of the age. And you go, yeah, but he left. He said, I'm with you always, and then they watched him leave. Because he sent a heaven-sent helper. Because if I go, I will send the Holy Spirit to be in you, with you, around you, for you. Because you can never enter into the promised future of God without him. And we never have to. The promise is to step with. To step with. To follow me is the challenge of God. God's promised presence is the key. Listen to me. Why does God say this again and again as he's getting started with Joshua to lead them? Because the presence of God is the key to our confidence and our courage. And you will never experience God's biggest and best without those, without confidence and courage. Paul picks up on the same theme. Watch this, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12. Paul writes, don't be so naive and self, 
What confident. You're not exempt. You could fall flat on your face as easily as anyone else. Forget about self-confidence. It's useless. Cultivate, say it, God. Cultivate God confidence. Learn God confidence. Because you won't make it if you don't have confidence in God. It's not self-confidence. God's promises fuel our God confidence. God's presence fuels our courage. Now, pay very careful attention to what God says to Joshua again and again and again, because he says it to us. God says, I've got an amazing future for you. I've got an amazing place for you guys. I have an amazing promise for you guys, but you're going to need some courage. Let me go, clue phone, there's some challenges. Now, Joshua had already been one of the scouts sent into the promised land, and he had already seen they had some big grapes and some big giants. How many know big grapes and big giants often go together? He had already seen some of the fortified cities. He already got an idea. And see, 10 of the spies came back and said, yep, it is an amazing place. Got to give it that. But it has some amazing enemies. I don't think we should go. How many know that every amazing place God has for you also has amazing enemies? So you need courage. You need confidence. And God says, you're going to face some things you've never faced before, but you're not going to face them alone. I am with you, and I want to give you the courage and confidence to face them. Now, here's why this is so important, and please, please, please stay with me. This, this, some of you may have grown up maybe in church, or you've, you've heard of Canaan, and Canaan's like heaven. Canaan, the promised land, was never a metaphor for heaven. Going into Canaan's not going to heaven. It's not, going in, it's not going into eternity because here's why. In heaven, we won't face enemies. And Joshua and his team face seven enemy nations. You won't face enemy nations in heaven. In heaven, we won't fight battles. Joshua and the Israelites fought at least 31 battles that are recorded in, in the, the book of Joshua. 31 battles. So it can't be heaven. Joshua and the Israelites stumbled and struggled, and so do we, and we won't in heaven. We do here and now, but not then and there. So listen carefully. God's promised future is not just heaven. So what was Canaan to the Israelites? What was the promised land to them? Same thing for us. It is literally a place and a life of victory. That's what the promised land is. The promised land is a place of victory, a life of victory. And to experience the victory, we need God confidence and God's courage. Now really dial in, because with greater opportunities comes greater opposition. Know that. With greater opportunities comes greater opposition. They go together. Paul writes this, one of my favorite lines, when he's going to minister in Ephesus, he writes in Corinthians, he says this about his time in Ephesus, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 9. A huge door of opportunity for good has opened up here. Don't stop there. There's also mushrooming opposition. Hold it. This is a great opportunity. Yes, and there's great opposition. Don't be surprised. There's great progress and great pushback. That's why Jesus, I tell you these things so that you won't stumble. I tell you these things so you'll be prepared, so you don't give up when it happens. So you don't say, I don't expect that. This shouldn't happen to me. With greater advances come greater attacks. Demonic attacks, difficult people attacks. I've heard it said, and it's so true, greater levels come with greater devils. And that is true. There's a hierarchy of evil. The more you advance in God, the more battles you fight with more advanced enemies. But the one who's with us has got us. Even when we don't see or sense him, his promise is, I'm with you. I will never drop you. I will never abandon you. And I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm a visual learner, so sometimes I need pictures for things. And I honestly believe that the Bible gives us all these stories. And some of my favorite parts of Scripture are the narratives because they're stories. Now, I don't know. I think it's a, a, part of it's a guy thing. Guys love stories. Like men kind of are more into movies. Women read books. 
uh, guys tell story jokes, like these long stories. Women don't, because we're like a we're like story. And Jesus taught in stories because he had a bunch of guys, so he taught them in stories. So stories, seeing things, this is kind of how I work. And so, so I, want, I want you to understand something that God says, as you enter in to the, the victorious life I have for you now, here and now, you're going to face opposition and problems and giants and struggles. So don't be surprised. Don't, what's happening to me? No, no, what's happening to you is, is, is you're stepping forward. And the greater the opportunity, the greater opposition, but you're not doing it alone. And I want to give you a visual kind of how, how this works. And it comes from one of my favorite movies. I'm not really a, a movie guy, honestly. I don't see that many movies. But, but I, there's one that I watched years ago that's one of my favorites. Now, I don't know about any of you, but I've, I've always loved animals. Like when I was a kid, I watched Mutual of All, Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Anybody? Yeah, us. I'm surprised I'm not an insurance salesman because I watched that like, like every Sunday, Saturday, whenever it was on. And I, I loved and I, lo- I, I just I, I loved the whole deal, except for the commercials. I loved the animal parts. So it was a, a movie that came out a number of years ago, one of my absolute favorites. It was called The Bear. And it, it's a story of an orphan bear cub whose long-term future was slim to none because he lost his mom. And a bear cub in the wilderness without a parent doesn't have much of a future. And then something really unexpected and unanticipated happens. This cub is actually adopted, chosen by this massive Kodiak male bear, which didn't usually happen. And this enormous Kodiak bear provides this cub with lessons about being a bear, teaches him stuff, mentors him, tutors him, guides him. Until one day they get separated. And baby bear doesn't see Papa Bear. Looks all over, doesn't see him. Isn't too worried until a cougar sees baby bear. And here's what happens. Just watch. All right, that was just for me. I don't know if you like it or not, but I want to see it on a big screen. <laughs> Come on. Now, I won't try to make everything spiritual out of it, but you have an enemy that's like a roaring lion, so let's just say it's biblical. I just love the scene because we don't often see the whole thing. It was just shot so well in that the cub finally 
takes a stand and roars. And that lion backs away. It's like, and then the camera pans back. Greater is he that's in you. You, got, you have a God who has your back. He's got your front. He's got your sides. He's within you. There are enemies bigger and greater than us, but you've never met an enemy bigger or greater than God. So his whole promise is be courageous and be confident. You're becoming someone. But it's not your becoming that's the key to your winning. It's who's with you, who's growing you, who's developing you, who's promised you a future. You were born with a promise. The question is, will you step into it? God's never made a person without a promised future for that person. Will you step into it? How do we do that? We're going to talk about that for the next several weeks. We're not going to cover every chapter, every verse, every line of Joshua. But we're going to look at what they learned about stepping into God's promised future for them and what you and I need to do to step into God's promised future for us. And it just starts with these three stepping lessons. They're, just, they're simple, but they're foundational. They're the key to, to starting and they're the key to going and growing and, and experiencing. And the first one is simply this, never stop stepping out. Just don't stop. You step out of sin. You step out of your old life. That's step one, leaving. But don't stop there. Don't get stuck in in-between land. Don't step out of the old but fail to step into the new. And people go like, this is, this is not what I thought it was, because you're not there yet. You're out, but you're not in. Don't settle for, for in-between land. I'll tell you the most miserable people I've ever met, and I'll tell you when I've been the most miserable in my life, is when I'm out, but I'm not in. I got enough of God that I don't enjoy my old life, but I don't have enough of God to enjoy my new life. Things bother me that didn't used to bother me, but I'm not in. So, so don't stop there. Don't stop in borderland. Step out and step in. Understand salvation is always both. It's a leaving and it's an experience. It's a going. It's leaving the old and experiencing the new. So never stop stepping out because there's more. There is more. I don't care how old you are, how young you are. In your marriage, in your family, in your finances, in your health, there's not an area of your life that you've arrived. There is more. That's the model that God wants you to have. Never stop stepping up. That means we must participate with the promises and the plans and the promises of God. Again, Peter says, God gave you everything you need, so make every effort. Why? Because you have all you need, but it takes your effort to make the most of what God has given you, to use it. I've given you gifts, use it. I've given you, I've given you resources, use them. Use what I gave you. Make every effort. Grow into it. Grow up in it. So my challenge to you is, what are you doing? What? The challenge is study his word. His word is his principles. His word is his will. His word is his ways. His word tells you what's wrong, what's right, how to get right, how to stay right. So, so let your mind be saturated. Don't worry about your fears. Meditate on God's promises and purposes and plans. But don't stop with downloading it. Do it. You'll be blessed not if you have a bunch of knowledge. The religious rulers had all kinds of knowledge, but they had no application. Do it. Put it into practice. You know what you do. That's why, honestly, for me, when I'm, when I'm working on, even when I'm reading Scripture, but when I'm working on sharing things with you that God is sharing with me, the question I always ask is, now what? What do I do with this? How do I apply it? Where do I apply this in my life? So that's my challenge to you. What in what area of your life do you need to do God's will for that area of your life? What can you do? And then the third one is never stop stepping with. 
We're not doing this thing for God. We can't. We're doing it with God. Because the greater one is in us, with us, behind us, before us, around us. There's never a moment in which he doesn't see me or have me. There are moments when I don't sense God and I don't see God and I don't feel God, but that doesn't mean God isn't with me because he's bigger than my seeing, my sensing, my feeling. He's as faithful as his word. And he says, I will be with you and I'll never drop or abandon you. And that's why you can step in to the future I have promised you. Would you bow your heads and hearts with me? God, I pray as we start this this new series that you would help all of us to believe there's more. To go after the more. To understand the challenge of stepping into what you have promised us. I thank you for those who stepped into your forgiveness and grace. May they not stop stepping. I pray for those of us, Lord, who love you. May we not stop stepping. I pray for those today, Lord, who feel stuck and trapped. And I pray for those today, Lord, who are struggling and stalled out, that they would experience the more that you have called and created them for. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed just for a moment. If you've never surrendered your life to Jesus and said yes to him, see, that's where it starts. Step one is just to say yes to the God who has a yes in his heart for you. And Right where you sit or online, you can simply pray a surrendering prayer. It's not a form prayer. You simply say, yes, God. I I, I accept Jesus as the Savior and leader of my life. He suffered on the cross to die and pay for me. He rose again so I could live again. And I receive that as a gift. Yes. And I will follow you. I will step, I will step and step and I'll follow you with my whole life. Now, Father, your word says to as many as receive you, you give them power to become. And I pray that power in this room and in our lives today. I pray your favor and blessing upon this family of faith. Lord, we have not arrived. You have so much more for us individually and as a family of faith. And I pray that we might experience the divine more. And I ask it and I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.